Hey, Mazzy here. Welcome back to uh, another episode of It's the Music Stupid. Uh, this is number 49, where I, I pulled together five albums from my collection that I want to showcase and share uh, some takes on the music and the albums. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about artwork, even though the music is primary here. So it's not about pressings or uh, any of that. But uh, I want to start out with uh, a singer-songwriter or writer. Can you imagine if you wrote a song that you could possibly live off of for the rest of your life. Well, Dennis Edmonton uh, pretty much did that. Now, I don't know his financial status, but I, he put out two albums under his name, and he considers these albums more like, um, I would say, uh, publisher demos. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. And the artist goes by the name Mars Bonfire. I mean, that's one of those names. I remember reading it on the the first Steppenwolf, the first two Steppenwolf records, and thinking, God, what a great name. So Mars Bonfire is a Canadian, Dennis, uh, uh, Dennis is his uh, actual name, but he went by the name Mars uh, Bonfire. He was in the band The Sparrows. The Sparrows would later split up, reconfigure, and uh, turn into Steppenwolf, and John Kay would join, and the rest is history. Uh, uh, those two albums, maybe three albums with Monster, but the first two albums are perfect blends of rock and roll, and and uh, John Kay's voice just really adds to that great tightness and just, just the, the, the sheer energy of, of the songs. Well, Mars Bonfire wrote the song Born to be Wild, so you could just, with all the commercials it's been in, all the movies, all the reissues, all the cover versions, this guy is still alive, climbing mountains, the, the Great Outdoors, but he made two records uh, in 1968 and 1969. This is the second one, and it's called Faster Than the Speed of Life. Now, uh, those of you st who are Steppenwolf fans might uh, recognize the name of that song on the second Steppenwolf album, but he didn't write that song. Now, he kind of refers to this album as almost like a publisher demo, where he did his versions uh, of songs that he wrote, including... Uh, the aforementioned uh, Born to be Wild, uh, for publishers, for the publishing. That's when other artists can hear the songs and cover them, and that's where you make it, only you're retaining your publishing. Uh, this is a Columbia promo copy, but it is a 2i here. Now, this album originally apparently came in 1968 on Uni Records, and then Columbia picked it up. And I had never seen a Uni copy, so uh, and I'd hardly ever see this. I mean, both his records stiff. They bomb. They didn't sell. This is really an interesting record, and it's better than you would expect it to be. It is a, um, I'd say, a smooth, psychedelic pop record. Now, obviously, his versions of, of, uh, of Born to be Wild is nothing as aggressive or as in-your-face as a Steppenwolf with John K. singing, but there's a certain... Um, romantic side to this record or, or that this version of romantic maybe is the wrong word but it's got a cool vibe a pop vibe i mean his voice is not a great voice it's almost like an, an easy listening voice but this version is probably more psychedelic in terms of the instrumentation now i couldn't find anywhere nowhere on this record i even looked it up i can't find out who the musicians are on this record anywhere so if anyone uh, knows and can uh, put a link uh, to directions but everywhere all music uh, Wikipedia, nothing, nada. Uh, you know, L.A. kind of pop record. The kind of songs on here that you would think you'd hear in a movie in the late 60s trying to emulate what rock and roll is about. Not quite as aggressive. They want it to be safe for a larger audience. Maybe you'd hear this kind of stuff in a Roger Corman type film. But it has its... Uh, it has an attraction to it. Uh, the songs are actually pretty good, and it's, it would have been nice to sing more of these songs covered by either Steppenwolf or other bands later. But I like this record. Uh, he would later go on to do projects as a session musician and writer and collaborate with Kim Fowler and The Seeds, apparently, uh, and, and basically retire from the music business and probably live off, live off uh, his mountain climbing and his nature hiking uh, and his royalties on Born to be Wild. So uh, kind of a cool record. Again, a promo copy. This uh, version came out in 1969. Whoever got this one, I think it's, there's a radio station there, but it li it's listing 
Christmas Day, 1978, that whoever got this album cataloged it in. So the very end of the year in 1968, I think the official release uh, was, obviously this was an advanced copy to a radio station, but it plays nicely, it's quiet, and I, I just, I really like this. Uh, I had never heard this record over the years, and a while back I picked it up, and uh, it's uh, delightful. Uh, but I think it's recommended if you want something really interesting. I could imagine this in the... Uh, Asset Archive, although even though it's a major label, there's something a little bit of a, a flowery sound to it, that kind of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's sunshine pop, but it's more in that direction than in the hard rock uh, presentation of Steppenwolf. Mars Bonfire, one of the great, great names in music and uh, in just in anything. God, Mars Bonfire, that's a, that's a name, right? Next is a record that's become very iconic to a lot of people, and this is... This is a wonderful record, and this is uh, The Silver Jews. Uh, this is their third album. Uh, they were around from 1989 to 2009, so they had a 20-year cycle. And uh, this is uh, the project of um, David Berman, who uh, led the band. David Berman was the only constant member of this band, and Stephen Malkus and... Uh, Bob uh, Nastanovich from Pavement are in this project, too. And uh, they're kind of, you know, some, I think, thought this was like an offshoot of Pavement, but they kind of ran a parallel to each other. Now, Pavement's more of a, 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 a grittier rock uh, alt band, indie, if you will. Uh, this has a really great raw alt-country, a lo-fi alt-country sound. I mean, there's a lot of influences in here musically of uh, New Young and Crazy Horse, not vocals, obviously, but you got David Berman's really low uh, voice uh, uh, in the, I would say, the genre of a Bill Callahan in that thing. I kind of like Bill Callahan's intensity uh, better, but lyrically, I mean, both of them are really interesting, but David Berman obviously had his own demons, and he was going through a heavy bout of drugs and alcoholism around the time making this album. And um, But it is a brilliant album. It's it got a rawness and country and very introspective lyrics, and it's a damaged soul, uh, you know, creation of an album. Uh, they would go on to make albums again for the, that 20-year period, and then uh, he would start a new project, a new band, uh, called uh, the Purple Mountains, and uh, Purple Mountains came out. I can't remember if it came out right be right before or right after uh, he hung himself, and it's a, a tragic story, uh, not one that's unusual in 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 the music uh, industry and then with bands and artists going through uh, situations like that. American Water was put out uh, by Drag City Records out of Chicago. All the Silver Jews records were on this label. And they're all really good. It's a great catalog to dive into if you like that, uh, you know, all country minimalist lo-fi sound. Uh, but they're really well recorded. They're they're tight recordings, not unlike the uh, Steve Albini records that I talked about recently. That has that really dry, you know, true sound of a band in a studio and his low voice and beautiful lyrics. There is a lyric sheet uh, here, and I advise you uh, to go through these lyrics. Um, and, you know, you can kind of get a feel of what he was going through at the time. Next is Tom Rush's The Circle Game from 1968 on Elektra Records. This is a fantastic singer-songwriter folk record. Now, he comes out of the, the folk sing out of Cambridge, Harvard in Boston. Uh, you know, went through the, also the Greenwich Village folk sing. Was on Prestige Records and recorded a number of folky blues records of traditional songs. Some originals, but mostly songs like San Francisco Bay Blues, a Jesse Fuller song, and uh, other blues-related crossover songs. Just him and a guitar, a very minimal production. Uh, this is a little more produced, and this is a fantastic record. Cover shot by Linda Eastman, uh, who would become Linda McCartney. It's just a beautiful, intimate shot. This was his biggest selling record in 1968 uh, for his entire career. He would later uh, switch to Columbia Records. Uh, now, the song, the title song, The Circle Game, is the Joni Mitchell song, and he recorded and released it several years before Joni Mitchell would uh, record it. And there's another song on here, uh, opens up with Tin Angel, another uh, Joni Mitchell song. So he's covering a lot of songs. He does James Taylor's Something in the Way She Moves. Uh, that was on his first album for Apple Records. And yes, 
he wrote that line first before uh, George Harrison used it in something, in the way she moves something. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a nice version of it. I like James Taylor's version on that Apple record. The first artist signed to Apple, by the way. But he also does a Jackson Brown song, Shadow Dream song. Uh, just a really good folk singer-songwriter album. The final track on here is a great song that he actually uh, re-recorded himself. He wrote it. It's called No Regrets. And it's on this album, and then it's later on one of the Columbia records where it's more produced with this orchestration. Beautiful recording. Uh, I don't know if I prefer the more, uh, you know, lo-fi-ish, the more the less produced version here or that one. And of course, that would become a massive hit for the Walker Brothers in the UK. No regrets. They do maybe the definitive version of it. But um, Tom Rush, The Circle Gay, 1968, He's got this low baritone voice. I just love him. I saw him in the 70s several times. And uh, someone doesn't get a lot of love around here, but uh, his folk records are fairly inexpensive to pick up as well. His is crossover country folk uh, bluesy records. But he got a little more uh, country folk in the 70s, more produced, uh, you know, as the scene was happening. So a great record from 1968 on Electra Records. Now we have the major label debut of the band from Redlands, California, that really kind of uh, gestated in Santa Cruz, at UC Santa Cruz, and that's Camper Van Beethoven. Uh, most people at least have heard of their first independent single, Take the Skinheads Bowling, as used in the title credits of um, Bowling for in Columbine. Um, David Lowry led singer. I just love this band. I know there's all this uh, controversy over the years from, by David Lowry with his uh, his relationship with Virgin Records, unfortunately. But uh, he had uh, several records uh, with Camper Van Beethoven, and then they broke up. Uh, internal problems, as usual, with bands, and he would form the band Cracker. I love both of these bands. I love his voice and. Uh, the nice part was when I first moved here, one of the great shows I saw at a club here was Camper Van Beethoven and Cracker, and he would play with both. And I think they were touring and, and changing up uh, who was opening. But um, this is a really unique band, and I just I just adore this band. Alternate uh, rock sound. They're kind of noisy sometimes, They're sort of post-punkish. Uh, they're a little bit of... Uh, you know, a pre-grunge thing. And this album came out in 1988. And this is called Our Beloved Revolutionary Sweetheart. And it's just that. The musician makeup is really interesting because not only do they have the, you know, the core rock band in here, they have a violin player. And they had a multi-instrument who left uh, before they went to uh, Virgin Records. But the violin and the way it's played, it's almost like Scarlett Rivera playing with Bob Dylan uh, on Desire, for instance, that gives them this sort of Russian lullaby, this middle, um, I don't know, this uh, mid-eastern sound on some of their songs. And it's very unusual. There's a certain uh, worldly sound to the, some of their songs, along with country and folky and rock and roll. The custom label uh, Camber Van Beethoven had with Virgin Records is such a beautiful record. It's one of my favorite. They incorporate the traditional two virgins there uh, with uh, their own uh, psychedelic-like typeface. You know, they, they could be included in a little bit of a modern psychedelic, but they're all over the place. They really mix uh, genres of rock and roll and um, ethnic uh, music, it almost seems like they come from the old Russia in a way with that violin playing. Uh, they open up with two tracks, uh, part one and part two of Aya Fatima, that has a lot of that sort of Russian culture with the violin in. And then they do a wonderful cover of the uh, old spiritual, the Southern song, O Death. And uh, it's, it's, it's a really uh, interesting version. It's a very different arrangement on that. But again, David Lowry has a, a sense of humor. The way they present things, he's very political and very uh, worldly, in a way like a Warren Zevon, not as, uh, you know, he has more of the smirk. Warren Zevon is more of a biting lyric in his in his songs. Uh, there is a, a song on here which I love called Tanya, and it's very kind of that uh, violin um, Russian kind of 
lullaby amped up a little bit about uh, Tanya, about uh, Patty Hearst, which is a great song. Ends with a wonderful uh, piece called uh, Life is Grand. But this is one of those records, one of those bands that I think really fits together despite all the detours on it. Again, this is our beloved revolutionary sweetheart by Camper Van Beethoven. Great songwriter, great band. I'm going to close out with a record from 1968 called Realizations by Joni Rivers. I kind of forgot how great this record is. This is a good sounding record. If you can find a clean copy, this record, it's a tight recording and it's a beautiful recording. The musicianship, uh, there is some lushness added. Now, this is Johnny Rivers, I'd say psychedelic entry to music. 1968, maybe it's a little late for psychedelia, but it really fits in uh, what was happening then. But it's on the pop side of psychedelia. There was one hit from this called Summer Rain, which is a great song. That was one of those summer songs that was all over AM radio in 1968. Mentioning Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, there's a line in there. And this is just an incredible record. Now, Johnny River comes from uh, the scene. Uh, great guitar player, was uh, was pretty much playing weekly. I think he had a year contract starting in 1964 uh, at the Whiskey A Go-Go in L.A. And um, he's one of those musicians pre-Beatles that even when the Beatles hit and everyone went to the the British invasion, he still maintained a successful, healthy career, albeit not, you know, way huge on the tar charts. But he was playing, you know, shows weekly at the uh, the club. And uh, the big hit he had was a version of Memphis, a live version recorded live. I think it was Lou Adler that recorded it and uh, put it out uh, live. And you hear the audience, the ambient of the audience. And um, the song, of course, that my generation that I got into in 1966 was his version, the song, his great single, Secret Agent Man. Um, that is an incredible, uh, incredible uh, single, I remember. And that was basically for the American version of the British TV show, Danger Man with Patrick Magoo, and here it was, the name was changed, they added that song at the beginning, and of course, he recorded the longer version, and Secret Agent Man uh, was a huge hit, that great intro guitar part, there's a man who leads a life of danger, what a great single, especially when you're 12 years old, listening to that song uh, in 1966, that's a single I just put on the other night, and uh, it, it's so good, and it still holds up, it just jumps in your face and that was recorded live at the um, at the cat at the uh, whiskey a go-go as well so you hear that the audience clapping and and joining along which adds to the, the 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 excitement of the song now i just totally went in a whole different uh, direction because that song is not on here secret agent man is not on here that was two years prior to this but this album actually did pretty well not you know the massive hit but the single was i think a top 10 single uh, summer rain he opens up with a very uh, interesting version of Hey Joe. Everybody, every garage band, including mine, uh, you know, played Hey Joe. Jimi Hendrix played Hey Joe. The Birds played Hey Joe. The Leaves played Hey Joe. Everyone played Hey Joe, it seems like, at that time. But this opens up with a very ambient sound, and he has a lot of sound effects and, you know, rain and, 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 um, just these wonderful bridges between some of the songs on here. That adds to that, like, it's like the Sgt. Pepper ambiance, like the beginning of opening of the of the Beatles album. That really was kind of one of the first albums that really had that, that everyone and their, you know, their cousins from the Stones uh, with a Satanic Majesty's Request to the debut, uh, Black Sabbath with the thunder and lightning that was added. There's that, that whole thing over a few years of sound effects and, and not having, you know, a lot of space between the tracks. And and this is just like that. Uh, James Burton plays guitar on here. I would say my only disappointment with this album, he's such a great guitar player, it's not a big guitar album at all. It's a singer-songwriter album, but the songs are really good. Um, and they're not all uh, originals here. Summer Rain was written by uh, James Hendrix, not Jimi Hendrix, obviously. He does a nice version. It's maybe a little bit of a safe version, of Wider Shade of Pale, the Procol Harum song, and this was a year after 
uh, the big hit of that, but he he does it well. It, it's a serviceable uh, version that adds to the, the feel of this uh, song. Brother, Where Are You Now? So there's a, by Oscar Brown. So there's a little bit of a, you know, the, the, the current politics and social uh, things that were happening of the time on this. Um, going back to Big Sur, of course, that great California Highway 1 enclave, which is the beautiful area down at Big Sur on the California coast. And he ends with a very nice version. Uh, obviously, it's not a very, um, it's not a definitive or a sh earth shaking version of Positively Fourth Street, the Bob Dylan song. But this is a great sounding record. And you, you almost forget what a great singer he is. Now, in, in Secret Agent Man, he's really in your face. You know, there was a man who lives a life of Dane. There's a different vocal style than he has here. It's a smoother style. But this is like a, a pop psychedelic album. It's not a deep psychedelic album, but it works. And it's very successful. I mean, uh, everything from the artwork uh, to the cover, the sort of uh, um, almost infrared-like uh, photography cover uh, to the beautiful... Big Sur type California serenity here of, of the insert. And um, it's it's just it's just a wonderful, wonderful record. And this was on Liberty Records. That was the label he was on. I guess Imperial, uh, IR Imperial, uh, a division of, of Liberty Records. But um, it's a fantastic record. I don't see this record uh, in the bins a lot, but I don't know if it's ever been uh, reissued, but this... I think could be a cool, uh, you know, Kevin Gray or someone go at it. I know this is the music, but you want a good sounding record when you have a great sounding record like this. So uh, Johnny Rivers, Realization, very pop psychedelic from 1968. And that's the end of It's the Music Stupid number 49. Uh, thanks for watching. As he loves you.